Hey everybody, welcome back to our conversations with the leaders and influencers in forensic science. My name is John Collins, and today I get to introduce you to a really interesting individual, Amy Jungwanat, who is a mindfulness expert. Amy is in Springfield, Virginia. She has a career in forensic science and education, a pretty impressive scientific ed education of her own. She used to work for for uh, the Bodie Laboratory. And in this conversation, I talk with Amy about some of the emotional and mental stresses that impact professionals in the occupation of forensic science and some of the things that they can do to become more effective mentally and emotionally in forensic science so that they can draw more satisfaction in their career and quite honestly be more effective as forensic science professionals. If you want to learn more about Amy, you can visit her website at www.mindgenllc.com. That's www.mindgenllc.com. This is Amy Jungwanat. Thank you. All right, Amy, so you have a really uh, a unique background. I've, I've worked in forensic science for many years, and I think until you and I were put in touch with each other by um, Jerry Miller at RTI, uh, we were getting ready, as you remember, to uh, possibly do a workshop at the mm -hmm. uh, International S Symposium on Human Identification, and because of the COVID-19 crisis, that kind of got knocked off our schedule, unfortunately. But, uh, but I had kind of followed you on LinkedIn, and, uh, and saw, you know, see some of your stuff. And I thought, my gosh, I, I, I thought what I did was unique, you know, like leadership consulting, executive mm -hmm. coaching with, with an emphasis on forensic science, but you're in a completely different kind of a niche field where you're getting into things like mindfulness and, you know, uh, I mean, you, you tell me, I mean, describe, how would you describe this niche field that you've created for yourself? I like to say I teach sustainable solutions to embody resilience. And to me, embodiment is both heart and mind practices so that we can show up as our best self every day, uh, whether that is our need to perform at our best self, our need to show up and be able to take in different perspectives, um, be able to make you know, better decisions you know, as leaders or as anybody working within criminal justice. And I imagine that, you know, in your, you know, in your current work, not only do you, you know, teach this stuff, but you probably have to live it as well. Because I tell you what, it's not, you know, being an entrepreneur and running your own business, I can say, is not for the faint of heart, but that's probably a fair statement, right? I mean, you've got to practice what you preach. I could not do this work if I didn't also have my own practice that goes along with it. I mean, for me, what that looks like right now is... Meditation is the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning that sets my day. And there's, it's also very research driven that if the first thing you do in the morning is something that has a positive impact on you, you're more likely to feel good and positive the rest of your day. Unlike a lot of people who's the first thing you do, and I was very guilty of this, is check your cell phone the first thing you wake up and you start scrolling and you're, and you're checking your email and social media and the news. And it's so easy to get off track and sidetracked and so you're starting your day kind of on the wrong side of the bed or the wrong foot. You know, and I tell um, you, I'm, I'm notorious for that, Amy. I like, I will, and, and this is, this has actually been a bad, I'll, be, I'll admit to you here. This has been a bad habit for me recently is, especially with everything that's going on right now mm -hmm. is I haven't even gotten out of bed yet. I'm laying in bed and I'm reading the news. Yeah. And you know, that's probably the opposite of the kind of the relaxation and the, the centeredness that you need to create for yourself when the day starts. Yeah. I mean, I would say try to knock it out of bed, but first five minutes you're watching your breath, just getting centered, getting grounded. And then you're more able to handle the news and the uncomfortableness and all, all of the things that are happening right now with the pandemic and race relations and protests and, you know, defunding the police, like everything. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot to take in. And especially, you know, like I'm raising a family and you know, John, you have kids too. And, you know, that's a whole nother element. They're not in school. <laughs> You're trying to figure that out. Um, and, and also explain all of this to them at the same time. Absolutely. So let's, so you have a background in forensic science. So, uh, and we have the same alma mater. We're both Spartans come from Michigan state university. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so you tell me a little bit about your, how you got in, you know, your education, how you got into forensic science and where you worked, what kind of jobs you held in the field. 
So I went to Michigan State knowing I wanted to study science, but I actually was interested in infectious disease research. And that is sort of like, I wanted to work for the CDC was kind of what my five-year goal plan was, which was probably very ambitious for five years. But, (laughs) (laughs) Um, But being at Michigan State was very interesting because they had one of the only forensic science programs in the country. You know, at the time, there weren't that many. And I took um, introduction to forensic science with Dr. Siegel Mm -hmm. and just like fell in love with forensics through that class. And being at Michigan State, I think, allowed me to go into that career where maybe if I started my foot off at a different school, I would not have found this way to connect science and criminal justice together. But you know, being there, I studied biology. I took a lot of forensic classes as electives. I studied forensic anthropology abroad in London. It was just a really good education that I had at Michigan State. Um, but when I looked to get my master's degree, I wanted just a different experience. I had worked with a lot of the professors there already. And so I moved out to the Washington DC area uh, to attend the George Washington University and there studied molecular biology and forensics. Um, Within a couple of months of starting my master's program, I started also started working for Bodhi Technology. Um, So I was an intern technician, you know, doing all the grunt work in the lab, taking out the trash, doing the dishes. You're good. So where's Bodhi? Where's Bodhi located? Actually, was that? So Bodhi's in Northern Virginia. It's just outside. Which is where you're based now, right? You're in Virginia. Yeah, I'm still in the area. Um, So, I mean, yeah, I was there as a technician doing all the grunt work and after I completed my master's degree, I started training to be a casework analyst. And, you know, through that process, I tested cases from all over the United States since we were a private industry. We had contract work with different laboratories, different law enforcement agencies, different prosecutors' offices. Um, and I worked in a section where I worked a lot of cold cases, homicides, used different technology to help Um, bring some investigative leads to the different cases. Um, And then through that, I ended up um, applying to become the DNA technical leader. And I was in that role for a while, which I loved, but I still say is the hardest job in the lab, (laughs) being the technical leader in DNA. There is just so many requirements that that role has to do. And And being, being in a large laboratory, it was a lot to handle. Um, But I liked at that stage, you know, I was overseeing training. I was really involved with our validation work and our research team and helping to make improvements in the laboratory and being really tied to the quality of the work that was being produced in the lab. You know, Amy, just uh, an observation that just occurred to me that I'll share with you. And and I'm not fully sure I understand why this is or if I'm, I'm possibly misstating it, misstating it. But so I've been, I've been working in my practice for, I began in 2013 was when I started my business, but I really started kind of rolling along in 2014, 2015. And um, since then, I have worked with more DNA professionals than any other of the, of the forensic disciplines. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that I have found that has always impressed me about DNA people, and again, I'm, this is just kind of a, an off the cuff observation, but um, I've, I've been impressed with how little ego they bring to the coaching sessions. They, the, the DNA community seems to be really, uh, they really prioritize their professionalism and they prioritize getting the job done above, you know, their own personal ambitions. And so I've worked with a lot of DNA technical leaders, uh, DNA analysts, and I was curious if you agreed with that, if that was your observation, or if you think I'm misreading it, but they just, I've always been impressed, even when you go to the Ishii meeting, Mm -hmm. it's a top-notch group of people, and I think they're transforming forensic science in a lot of ways for the better. I mean, it's a very passionate group of people. Um, It is very connected. I think people care a lot about their jobs, the quality of the work, the impact that they're having. Um, I also think there's a lot of type A personalities in DNA. Oh, yes. (laughs) Um, And and along with that, you know, kind of comes this need for perfectionism. And so that's going to be spread into like all the different things that are happening, whether that is how you show up better as a manager or that's the quality of work you're doing. There's some level of wanting to do it perfect. Yeah. Um, and so that, that shows, I think, in different ways. 
So you make, I mean, obviously the, I, and I know as well as anybody as you do that uh, making that jump, I mean, you think about all of the time and money that you invested in your education and the time you put into your career and your training. And, and so I'm going to, I'm going to just jump out of the profession and I'm going to become a mindfulness expert. I'm, I'm purposely being, you know, yeah. uh, d- dismissing the importance of what you do, being a little bit humorous here, but, but, it, but on all seriousness, obviously something inspired you uh, to make a major shift in what you were doing. I'd like to know a little bit about what that was. Yeah, I think, I think part of the history is by my whole experience in forensics, but it really came to a forefront when I was the laboratory director um, because I started to feel a personal sense of the morale in the laboratory. And I had a lot of stressed out colleagues and I was very stressed out too. So I was experiencing more brain fog. I knew I wasn't coming up with the most creative solutions at the time that I could, you know, as, as time went on, I mean, Bodie went through a lot of changes when I was there and especially in the lab director position, we were acquired by LabCorp. We merged with Cellmark. I mean, those were huge challenging times. And, you know, I was sort of heading down this burnout path and I can see it more now that I've, I've studied this and I speak to this. Um, and try to provide solutions that, you know, I was, I was burned out (laughs) and so was my boss. And so was the people around me. So like as a team collectively, like things just didn't feel very good. Um, and I know like for myself, I had to find something that was going to edge these feelings that I was having. Um, at the same time we were processing just a ton of sexual assault kits every month. That was sort of when the Danny project started and the Saki project started where there was the call to submit all kits. Um, And I was reviewing a lot of sexual assault cases, you know, on the weekends at home at night and just the impacts, like I got to the point where I just couldn't read another medical report of a woman being raped. And that I saw play out in different roles in my life and how it started to affect my my point of view where I felt safe going where I didn't feel safe going. And so there was an element of vicarious trauma. And again, at the time, I didn't know what that was either. Um, But I started going to a meditation class once a week. And through that practice, I just, I started to feel better. And I started to have small changes, which I felt if I did this every day instead of once a week, maybe I would see even more changes. Um, and through that, it was just like this awareness woke up in me that there were bigger underlying issues in criminal justice, also in forensic science that I didn't think was being addressed or solved because a lot of people were in that survival mode of their brain, um, on a day to day basis where all, you know, a lot of us were on autopilot and you're just trying to do the things, get through the day, put out the fires. You can't get your own work done. There's constant email, there's constant phone calls, rush cases, It's like the high demand of the job didn't ever really seem to stop, but there wasn't support of when the current things you have in life to maybe deal with this isn't working anymore. What do you do? The culture was very much suck it up. Um, And even when I first started going like, Hey, I'm going to bring mindfulness to forensics. You know, people were like, what? what's that? Okay. <laughs> like, right. You know, this is how it's always been. Like you have to have a special part in your brain to do this work. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really believe that. Um, and you could see also a lot of the stress coming out, you know, when forensics was is under the microscope of, you know, these practices in the past sent these people to jail. They shouldn't have, how are we going to change forensics? And people started to get very defensive about their individual fields. You know, DNA has been under attack with DNA interpretation. And you could see public letters coming out from executive leaders of their stance. And you'd read it and go, you're really stressed out and you're writing. This is a very defensive approach that you have taken to stand instead of like, let's listen to each other. Let's open up, like, let's fix this. And I think there is more of a like Band-Aid approaches that have been happening. Um, so I saw, saw this need kind of from multiple levels, you know, on an individual level, helping with stress and burnout. Um, but then when you can start to overcome that, you can make improvements in your organization. And then ideally we make improvements in criminal justice. You know, we start to fix some of the things in the system that aren't working anymore. You know, you probably, you probably experienced what I experienced. I think some of the most, uh, stressed out people in the criminal justice system are prosecutors. 
I mean, I, you can see it on their faces. I mean, the stress is dripping out of their ears. And, um, and that comes to, and because they have such a prominent place in the criminal justice system, it comes to bear heavily on everybody that they work with, including forensic scientists and police. And there's, you know, there's almost kind of like a, for lack of a better word, almost a, a bit of an inhumanity to the criminal justice system and some of the expectations that are placed on its, on its practitioners. It's an inherently punishment oriented profession which I think we're starting to get away from, and maybe that's for the better. Um, you know, we're seeing that, that, uh, that perpetrators of crime, you know, research shows a lot of them have learning disabilities. They come from very socio socioeconomic disadvantaged backgrounds and, and so forth. And was that your feeling when you were in the criminal justice system, that it kind of had this just nastiness to it, toxic, like this inherent toxicity to it? I mean, you only have to spend a couple hours sitting in the hallway of a courtroom waiting to testify to see yeah. the injustices that are in our world and in the, in the justice system. I mean, I think one of the hard parts about being a forensic scientist is that you're not really, you're not part of the team because you're supposed to be providing unbiased data, you know, the prosecutor can have their whole theory about what happened. The fence has their theory about what happened, but you're supposed to be testing evidence to help them piece it out. But working in that ad adversarial system, you know, it's, I often felt like a pong, you know, it was almost like a game instead of really being able to talk about the science and explain it well. Um, I, you know, of course there were cases where I, I felt that that happens, but there were definitely instances where you're cut off and you're limited to what you can say and it's yes and no. And, um, you leave there not feeling very good. Like, I don't, not sure the jury actually got what they were supposed to get at the end of the yeah. day. Um, so th th there definitely is that. I think, you know, working in an adversarial system and some of this, like when there is a case that is solved, I don't really feel that scientists feel that they can celebrate. Like, what does that win look like for a forensic scientist? Um, and oftentimes too, you know, you'll see cases that are in the media and the forensic scientists never think, you know, it's like the police did this, investigators did this, the prosecutors did this. And it's like, well, what about all of the things behind that? It's like, you need to think all those people. And um, yeah, the forensic science profession sometimes seems like it's, you know, it's in the back corner and doesn't always get the, the gratitude it should have either. Do you think that's one of the more uh, pressing challenges in forensic science when it comes to our, you know, emotional, mental, even spiritual health, the fact that we, you know, we struggle, we struggle with our identity as professionals. I remember a good friend of mine, uh, Max Hauk, wrote a, a, uh, an article a while back, and it was titled, Who Owns Forensic Science? Or I think it was, Who Owns Forensic Science Anyway? And in his article, he talked about, um, you know, that everybody seems to lay a claim to forensic science except the forensic science professionals. We, we seem to be forced to react to what everybody else wants. In some countries, forensic scientists actually are called by judges. They're called by the courts. They don't play on a team, which I've always found to be a very attractive model. Um, but do you think that that's part of the challenge that we, you know, we struggle with our identity? You know, what is, you know, you know, uh, you know technically we're not supposed to be scientists in the courtroom. We're supposed to answer questions. Yeah. The courtroom is where law is practiced, not science. That's hard. I think the U.S. probably does have things a little bit backwards. You know, there are other systems that seem to work better. Like, for instance, you have an expert for the prosecution. You have an expert for the defense. They meet. They agree on what is going to be presented. And that is what is presented. Instead of trying to kind of confuse everybody with this expert has this Ph.D. And this expert has this experience. And they work these cases. And it almost ends up being this battle of like ego or like who has a better background, like who should this jury believe has the right evidence um, sometimes comes into play in the courts. Um, but, you know, I've always had a hard time, you know, going to court and they'll say, well, how come you've testified so many times for the state, but you haven't testified that much for the defense? And it's like, well, it's because the state is the one who's submitting the case to the crime lab. Like, right. You know, it very little, it's like if the defense is doing work, it's because they're doing rework or they're doing additional testing. They're not the initial submitters of a case in general. Um, and so there were so many cases where you do, you are tagged as part of a certain side because they were the initial submission of, you know, submittal of the case and how that was worked. 
Um, but I don't know, like I, I was very tied to my job as an identity, which yeah. I think was I was too. Problem. I was too very much. So and when you talk about like leaving and starting your own thing in that first year, I struggled because I was like, but I'm a forensic scientist, but I'm a, I'm a lab director, but I'm a, because I spend so many hours doing that job and I poured my heart and blood and sweat and tears into everything that I did that it was kind of like a bad breakup and you're like, well, who am I now? And it's like, none of us are our jobs or professions, but I think a lot of people will cross that line and that's what they know that they are. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll tell you, Amy, I would argue that you are every bit the forensic science professional that you always were. And I feel that same way about myself because ultimately we have, we've committed, we commit a big chunk of our lives and our brain power and our, you know, our, our sweat and our efforts and we take risks on behalf of this profession because we care about it so much. And I, you know, I really, I, I think that's the case. I, I, I feel like even more of a forensic science professional now than I ever did because of the opportunity I get to help so many people, you know, as, as do you. But one of the things I do want to ask you, you had brought up, you brought up meditation. And I, I want to ask you about that because one of the questions I want to ask you is what could, what do you feel like forensic science professionals, if they just wanted to begin the process of trying to improve their, their mental, emotional health, exp, you know, uh, uh, nurture more mindfulness, you know, what would you see as being the priorities? But I want to ask you about meditation first, because my, my actual first uh, meditation fascinates me because my first introduction to meditation was actually when I was a college athlete. And and so meditation was a way, was a tool that we could use to try to lower anxiety mm -hmm. and make it more likely that during the athletic contest, we could perform without self-imposed limitations. But as I got older and, you know, started working in professions that were more stressful and, you know, forensic science and so forth, uh, and, uh, and, you know, just dealing with the natural anxieties that come with, you know, having kids and families and all this kind of stuff that I've always taken an interest in, in meditation. The struggle for me is just being, is being consistent about it and trying to do it every day. But there's different components to it, right? There's breathing, there's what you do with your thoughts during it. But if you were to kind of give just a quick tutorial on what meditation actually is, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what meditation actually is. What would you tell people that meditation is really all about? Yeah, I think some of the confusion stems in that there are a lot of different lineages and varieties and types of meditation, but at a basic level, it's getting you to the stillness and silence that rests inside. And so often we don't feel that we have that because our thoughts are continuously ruminating and we do have 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. And so where do you find the silence where you can actually listen to your inner wisdom? You know, basic components of meditation, I would say, is getting comfortable. And that doesn't need to look like sitting cross-legged on the floor with your hands in a mudra, which I think everybody's like, do I have to right. sit like this? Right. It's like, no, like I literally wear flowing wake up robes in the morning. and the <laughs> Yeah. I wake up in the morning, I sit up in bed, and that's how I meditate. I mean, what you want to try to prevent is falling asleep. Um, a lot of people will fall asleep when they first start meditating because you probably aren't sleeping good enough at night. Right. And, and that's okay. That's a natural thing that will, that will happen. So lay down if you want to sit up against the wall. Like there doesn't need to be a way that it looks. Um, I think working with the breath is one of the most important tools that you can ever do because it is always with you and it is, can be an instant pattern interrupt. So if you're feeling stressed out, you can connect to your breath. You can calm yourself down. When you practice in a meditation practice, then you're able to start to you know, change some neural networks in your brain that will allow you to not react to stress as much later on. So when I say watch your breath, you want to connect with it on a level of, I usually start by paying attention to it coming in and out of my nose. And you'll gen generally will feel a slight change of temperature as you notice yourself breathing in and breathing out. And you can continue to watch your breath as it goes down your throat, fills your chest and fills your belly. And then you can watch it as you exhale. And when I you just say continue. watch, when you say watch, you're talking, you kind of mean like to, to visualize it as yes. if you could actually see the breath and okay. Yep. And so that creates a certain type of focus and concentration. Now, while you're doing that, you're going to have thoughts of other things popping in your head. Like, 
oh, I wonder what the coronavirus numbers are today. You know, what, what happened with this? Um, oh, I have to take care of this problem. I need to go grocery shopping. So those thoughts are going to happen naturally. Um, when you have the awareness that you're no longer following your breath and you're thinking of something else, you drift your awareness back to your breath. So meditation becomes the constant drifting of back and forth. Say it's like flexing your mindful muscle in your brain. And that's, you know, the gist of what the meditation experience is going to look like. Um, a lot of times there is a judging element involved. You know, am I doing this right? Is this doing anything for me? So that's a very common, common thoughts to have. Again, you just go back to drifting. Um, you know, if your leg falls asleep or something happens, like it's okay to move. Like <laughs> you don't just sit there like you're frozen. Like so, move, get comfortable again, and then go back to your breath. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't have to be taken very serious either. But the one thing that caught my attention is you said, um, "I can't." The consistency is what is what gets in my way, and that is the common issue with most people. Not even just with meditation, but right any habit we're trying to build trying to do consistency is sort of this human problem that we all have. Um, so one of the easiest things to do is look at what other habits you already have going on. And if you can attach meditation to something you already do every day, then you're more likely to show up for your meditation practice too. You know, I have, I have felt one, of, I think one of the realizations that I've come to just in my own my own journey. Uh, one of the things that I like to do, in fact, I'm looking at it right now, but right across the street from my office, um, there's a park and it has a river running through it, lots of trees. And one of the things that I find very uh, meditative is the sound of wind going through the trees. And so whenever, whenever it's a breezy day, I like to go into the park so that I can hear the wind going through the trees because I find it incredibly relaxing. But it's actually just for, for, the, for helping our viewers, our viewers understand what meditation is, it's actually a really amazing experience to sit for a fairly lengthy period of time and actually not think about anything and just be aware. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about this mindfulness muscle, that's kind of what you mean, right? That you, you're able to attach, kind of connect with that stillness inside you. And one of the, what that reveals to me or what it has revealed to me is that one of our goals in life is not necessarily should not necessarily be the pursuit of happiness but the, but the pursuit of peacefulness because that peacefulness is an amazing feeling when you can just sit and actually not think about anything and just be aware mm -hmm. yeah so a couple of things there um nature very calming um even if you're like i can't can't bear to sit and meditate in nature, then take a walk in nature and pay attention to your feet hitting the floor could be your focal point. Um, the wind is a great focal point. So instead, so just pay attention to the wind and the sounds and all the different things that you're noticing the wind connecting with as your meditation. And when you notice you've drifted to thoughts, feelings, or sensations, you drift back to the wind. Um, I think, you know, the more and more work that I do is it really is introspection that I think is one of the most important things that we can do. And that is, I think just breaks down so many barriers because when you are at peace with yourself, when you love yourself, then you just want everybody else to be loving themselves too. And so it really, I think breaks down some of those barriers of, of looking at people like competition of looking at people like I need to be above them or have control over them. And we, I think can just create a little bit, better humanity. What a great segue into my next question. You know, we're going through, so today is what, June 10th, I think, um, and we're uh, 2020. And so we're going through a really, I think what's going to go down in history is a really fascinating period in the, in the history of the United States. And that is the, the uh, aftermath of the death of George Floyd up in Minneapolis and the, the newfound attention that is being paid to race relations in the United States. But what's really interesting about this, and uh, it has, it's really motivating, including me, a lot of people to look, to, to study and understand these issues in a way that we never did before. Mm -hmm. But this, this, what's going on right now doesn't just feel like, like one particular 
race or group of people of a certain skin color, you know, fighting for their rights. This has more of a global feel to it. Like we're starting to realize that anytime we disenfranchise anybody else or mistreat anybody else, that we are all, um, we are all damaged by it, regardless of the color of our skin. But I think that the work that you do and your expertise is relevant to this because, because I think these interpersonal tensions that happen are a lack of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious what your, what your thoughts are on what we're, what we're witnessing right now from your perspective. I mean, I think there's a major call for policy change and looking at how funding is being spent, especially in the interests of the black community and minorities community. You know, how do they get funding for education and healthcare? How to create more peaceful communities or maybe police is not such a presence. Um, but I think to transcend some of these conversations, like we're 2020, we're having this conversation. This conversation happened in the 60s. You know, blacks came over as slaves and that, there, that, is, that is the history in America that we have to live through and live down. And um, we have to be able to have that conversation that conversation doesn't come easy if we're not also trying to heal our hearts and minds at the same time. Um, and mindfulness has been looked at in ways, can it help with, with racial bias, implicit bias, um, and other things, because it has some components to it, which seems like it should be able to help. Um, one is that, you know, there's a very big compassion practice that is involved with mindfulness. And so in general, as you practice mindfulness, you tend to just treat people in a more fair and balanced way. Um, but there are also things that are going on in the mind the more you practice. So, you know, a lot of people right now are in survival mode that started with the pandemic. If you weren't already experiencing it just day to day, because, you know, stress is any times our needs are not met and that happens kind of constantly. We'll go into to, you know, I'll say fight or flight is like the easy way to explain it in survival mode. And that's where more of the anxieties come out. That's where more of the depression comes out. And when you transcend that, you just want to feel good again, we end up in an instant gratification stage. And that's where many people stay. They stay in instant gratification. And with that comes my, my ego wants to feel good. I need to have control over situations, which may look like I have to have control over certain races and people because I don't want my privilege to go away. Um, and then I go back in survival mode and I go back to instant gratification. What mindfulness is doing is it's allowing you to access parts of your brain that are involved in executive functioning skills. Um, and so parts of the brain that end up becoming, you know, used when you're practicing mindfulness is that um, areas that help with decision making, that help with creativity, that help with memory. And then the amygdala, which controls our fight or flight response, actually can be reduced in size with the more mindfulness practice. And so that's a lot where the emotional responses come from and our very reactive defensive responses are coming from is when our amygdala is sort of running the show and we don't have our best foot forward, we're not thinking clearly. Um, even a 10 minute mindfulness practice when you're experiencing something like that can switch you off into a different gear so that you know, you can see the bigger picture. You can listen to other people who maybe have different opinions than yours and start to come to some of the resolutions that are really needed um, instead of just thinking, well, it's been this way and this way seems to work. So let's figure out how to keep those straps tied so that we keep working in this, these same approaches. Um, the other thing that it does, you know, mindfulness, you know, a basic definition is it's non-judgmental awareness in the present moment. It's really trying to get you grounded. And so a lot of our biases are because of our past. You know, a, a lot of things, things we've seen, things we've heard, things we've been taught, things we've witnessed. And when we can become present with what's going on, our past doesn't have as much power over us. And so there has been a little research to show that mindfulness can help people become grounded in the present moment where they actually see an improvement and that they are not as swayed by the stereotypes that they would be triggered by easily otherwise. Question I like to ask people uh, when I do these kinds of interviews is in your, 
in your current professional capacity since you began your um, your your work in this area, what has been something that surprised you the most? Something that you learned that you totally didn't expect? Something about our reality or your reality that you had never really uh, understood before until now? I mean, some of the big relation that I came about was that I think a lot of decision making and issues are coming from places of stress and anxiety. And that was one of the most obvious things that I saw when I became researching this more and also practicing myself, that I was a very reactive person. And I think we have um, certain default responses that we naturally come by. You know, Some people are avoiders, they're not gonna get involved no matter what. Um, I was what you call a fighter. So I was going to stand up and fight for what I think was right. And, oh, I'll fight for you because you won't stand up for yourself. And, <laughs> you know, and that can be an okay reaction some of the time, but not all the time. That, that reaction is not needed all the time. But that was kind of how I showed up. Um, and so the more I practiced, I would have like a gap, you know, small. We're talking like split seconds where it's like, do you want to respond that way? And before I didn't have that gap, so it just like went off and it's like, oh, actually, no, I, I don't want to respond at all right now, or I'm going to take a couple of days to think about this. Um, so that gap, I think, is what people sometimes call like the edge in mindfulness, like how you get ahead because you're able to respond instead of react. Um, the more I've practiced and I can let go of external forces a lot easier too. And I think, you know, so much you talked about like people pursue happiness, but ha happiness usually is attached to something. Um, but really it, it rests inside, right? You can always be happy no matter what is happening out here because it is an internal decision, but that's not something that's easily turned on. That has to come through the constant practicing of that. Um, so I think I can easily, more easily let go of things. Um, and you know, it's not that I don't ever like snap or, you know, I don't want to portray this as like, I'm completely transformed. Um, but I, I'm aware, like when I don't act right, I'm like, oh, I need to go apologize. <laughs> like, you know, there is that yeah. awareness that comes with You know, I think when you, um, when you talk about that gap or that space that exists between the, the stimuli, the stimulus and our reaction to it. And you said that that's, that's where the mindfulness sits. And so as you grow your mindfulness practice, that space grows. And so it becomes easier and easier to respond to things that happen with intention as opposed to reaction, right? Yes. And, but I also think I would go, uh, I would add to that and say that that's where professionalism exists because I think professionalism is, is really one's ability in, in a, in an occupational environment or in an occupational context to be able to make choices and react to things in an intelligent, intentional way as, a, as opposed to, you know, just rather than just kind of flying off the cuff or, or reacting. And so, you know, I, I find that as, as a coach, a professional coach, I find that to be a really important uh, lesson that you're bringing up. Uh, when you when you think about the future of forensic science, um, you know, obviously we want forensic science to be a profession that people want to go into. And then and when they get into it, they feel like it's rewarding and it's, uh, it, uh, you know, it's enjoyable and they stay in it. You know, we don't want people being overwhelmed and stressed all the time. Every now and then it, it happens. But how do you think the future of forensic science has to play out for this profession to be healthier for people and more enjoyable and more rewarding? I mean, I think personal professional development has to become just as important as technical development. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen, you know, working in your field that people can't find the funds for this type of work because they have to send people to conferences. Um, you know, or they're like, well, we'll just take care of this by, uh, by bringing you in to do a workshop. And then it's like, we did our thing. And it's like, no, this has to be a constant, like, training and an integration. And it is, it is a policy change in your laboratory or business or organization if you want to see the growing effects of this. It can't just be a like, hey, we had this really nice stress reduction workshop, um, you know, 
people will might feel good at the end of that, but like you said, the staying consistent with it and, and working on it, that all takes time. You know, it's it's no different than integrating a new technology that has taken months to validate, months to train, um, and then you got to go back and you got to rework it. Like it's the same, I think, with professional and personal development, and it's an area that you know it's sort of ebbed and flow, where people tend to care about it and maybe not so much. You know, other other things I see is really you know looking at other fields, um, bringing in more good business practices into forensics. You know, so many people in higher level management were scientists, don't necessarily have the business management background to, you know, go with what they're forced to, to deal with in their jobs. Um, and I think so often we forensic scientists feels like it's this it's this special field, but there's so many other industries that are going through the same thing. I mean, I kind of laugh. So when I you know, became a consultant and I, I now have gone through lots of different trainings, but I went through yoga teacher training and the yoga community and the forensic science community are like so unparalleled similar. How do we make sure that our policies and everybody's trained the same way? And it's like, I could just come in and tell you everything we did in forensics and then just apply it to yoga. Yoga and, and forensics. I never would have seen that. That's. <laughs> and so you know, I don't think that we're alone. So when it comes to evaluating technologies, the answers probably lie in another industry. When it comes to best practices, it probably lies in another industry. And so I think there needs to be more interconnectedness between different people instead of feeling so isolated. So if, you know, a lot of, a lot of our listeners are leaders in forensic science, executive level leaders, we're thrilled to have you on the forensic science executive as a, as a contributor on our editorial board. And you've got an article that's uh, just coming out right now in the, in the next issue of forensic science executive. So I'm looking forward to working with you in the future. But for right now, if, if uh, an executive level leader in forensic science could just make one change to their work environment that would help improve the emotional and mental well-being of their employees what would that one thing be so if you're looking at what they can do for others i would say a gratitude practice is one of the most powerful impacts that they can have and not just saying thank you in an email but really telling people why you are grateful for them the work that they're doing um, publishing it if you can like having it up in bulletins i don't think people are given that level of satisfaction enough to show that their work matters because so often I do think we we experience what's known as moral injury and I don't know if you're familiar no. with that term no. but it first came out in sort of healthcare workers and that you you know you become a doctor so that you can make a difference and you can make a change but the reality is the system is kind of crushing you you're overworked you're underpaid and you rarely see the outcome of your patients and it's like that can be applied very much to forensics is that we rarely know the outcome of the cases that we're doing. It's a high demand job. We're working a lot of weekends, a lot of nights. We're not getting paid probably what we should be getting paid. Um, and it starts to wear on you that you're not really seeing the impact and benefit of your work. So I think the more leaders can do to show people the impact of their work. You asked me for one thing, I'm saying gratitude for that. Mm -hmm. um, for themselves personally, you got to do the inner work. And I, I just know that when people can themselves tap into their own inner wisdom, that ripples out through everybody that you work with. Um, and so I think for themselves individually, if things are going well, you work with that. You're thankful for it. You keep the goodness going. When things aren't going well, you take a nap and you meditate. <laughs> Could it's you? that easy. Yeah, it is. Problem solved. Problem solved. You know, when you talk about gratitude practice, I almost wonder, um, I know in the, in the executive accelerator that I do for forensic science professionals, which is an executive leadership training program, um, one of the uh, modules that we have is we talk about running effective meetings. You know, I'm almost wondering if you can work a mindfulness practice or part of this could be in every staff meeting, starting your staff meetings with talking, having people talk about something that, they're, that, that happened, let's say, in the last month that uh, made them feel good or that they were grateful for, and actually make that part of your organization's strategic conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that make sense? Definitely. Um, I mean, I think it even becomes more impactful when people start thanking each other. So when you can have coworkers calling out other coworkers that help them do things, when you can 
bring about the impact or maybe you're reaching out to prosecutors and law enforcement on some of the casework that was done and you can bring those impact statements back to the laboratory. You know, even just integrating a few minutes of silence at the beginning of a meeting can be a powerful mindfulness practice too. Because so often, like I know, I, I had meetings, overlapping meetings. I was just constantly, you know, jumping, jumping. And you, it takes a minute for you to be like, why am I in this meeting? How am I gonna stay present and focused? And putting the cell phone aside, not checking the email, have that meeting be focused on it, um, I think can be a way to be more mindful while you're there. And like, hey, if you feel that need to be pulled in other directions, then leave the meeting because then <laughs> you're not supposed to be there, right? I want to get feedback from people that says, hey, John, I really enjoyed that uh, interview with Amy, but I got people sitting in the fume hoods meditating. <laughs> <laughs> I want a picture if that's happening. <laughs> yeah. Use that in your marketing materials. This is, this is what progress in forensic science looks like. I mean, I got pictures of cops meditating. I still don't have my lab coats meditating in a photo yet. I need that. <laughs> oh, we need to work on that. <laughs>